Hello and welcome to Foundations and Accountancy FA2, Maintaining Financial Records. This is chapter number one, the very, very beginning of our sessions, and this chapter looks at the conceptual framework. Now, this conceptual framework, it's quite woolly and quite theoretical, but it's absolutely critical. If you understand the conceptual framework and you can understand the theory upon which every single accounting standard is based, you will understand almost every single accounting standard. It's that important. So if you understand this, you'll get all of the other nasty accounting stuff that you're going to do throughout the whole of your studies. In addition to that, you're definitely going to get some questions on this in the exam. So you definitely need to learn it, I'm afraid, guys. And there are some questions on the online portal at the very end, which will allow you to make sure you do understand it properly. Now, the conceptual framework that we have at the moment, it's continually being updated and being reviewed and revised and such. The last time we looked at it was in 2010. It does take some time for the conceptual framework to be updated because there's so much discussion about it before anything changes. So what now happens is the conceptual framework, when it was first put together, which was well over 20 years ago, was actually discussed and changed in 2010. And that's the current one that we're using. It's actually produced by the IASB, which is the International Accounting Standards Board. So the IASB is the International Accounting Standards Board. We've seen that as a multi-choice question before, so do learn that, please. International Accounting Standards Board. And what it's supposed to do is give us an understanding of what the standards are attempting to achieve. So it tries to tell us what the standards are going to try to do. And if we can understand that, then all of a sudden we've got a keen understanding of how they should then be used. Now, the big focus that we have here, and we'll come to this a little bit later on as well, is on the users of financial statements. What we say is the users of financial statements need to glean financial information. So they need to be able to get financial information from these financial statements and allow them to make economic decisions. Now, the type of economic decisions I'm thinking about will be dependent upon the users. So the type of economic decisions we're thinking about will be dependent upon the users. But we do have one key user group that we always try to make sure that we give the information to. That's our shareholder group, our investor group. They are critical. Now, what we have within our conceptual framework are various different chapters which allow us to focus our attention on certain different areas. The first chapter that we look at is the idea of objectives. Now, the key objectives of financial statements is to actually provide financial information to users so they can make economic decisions. The way I'm talking to you about this and the phrases I'm using are very specific. So it's financial information being used by users to make economic decisions. The way that's phrased is really, really critical. Then what we need to do is we'll have a look at the qualitative characteristics of financial information, which will mean that our users can hopefully understand it. There will then be various different underlying assumptions. And then once we have the underlying assumptions, that tells us exactly what we're trying to achieve, how we're going to do it. We can then start thinking about the elements of our financial statements. So the things that are actually included within it. And we develop that beyond this chapter. So this is the starting point for the elements. We then develop that over the next two or three chapters as well. Now, start at the beginning of this conceptual framework, looking at our objectives. Now, the objectives of financial statements have always got to be to allow our users to make economic decisions. Now, if we were in class and we were chatting about this, I'd be saying that my key user group will be investors. So my key user group will be current and potential future shareholders. They need to know whether they should buy more shares whether they should sell some shares or whether they should just hold on to their shares. So the buy, sell and hold decision becomes the economic decision of our investors. However, there are other users as well which are identified within the conceptual framework. They're still important, but they're not as important as, in, as our investors because the investors are the people that actually own the business. Now, other users that we have will include parties such as employees. And employees want to make sure that they get paid on a regular basis and they want to make sure that they have an element of job security and potentially some sort of element of progression, maybe a career progression over the next number of years. So I need to make sure that the business is going to be a safe and secure one. From a lender's perspective, lenders aren't necessarily interested in long term security. 
but they are very interested in short-term security. So they need to make sure that the business will be in place in the short term such that their loans can now be repaid. Now notice we've got different time horizons here. This is important because the economic decisions our users will make will be different and they'll have different time horizons. Therefore, they need different types of information. So employees and investors might be interested in longer term profits. Lenders are interested in shorter term cash flows. So that now means we need to make sure we can achieve all of their objectives with one set of financial statements. This is one of the reasons why we have things such as our profit and loss account, our statement of financial position. The statement of financial position tells you where we are today. The profit and loss account tells you how we got there and therefore you can predict what's going to happen next year. We also then have a cash flow statement. And as you develop your studies, when you come to the next paper, we look at the cash flow statement in a lot of detail. We don't really hit it here, but it is something which is important to certain users. Other users that we have will include suppliers and customers. And suppliers and customers want to make sure that you will be in business for the next maybe year or so, so that they can continue to supply goods to you, or to make sure that you can continue to service the warranty of the goods that they've, they've just purchased. So customers need to make sure that their warranties will be serviced. Suppliers need to make sure that their business will stay in business as well. They could both be very important. We need to make sure the financial statements actually adhere to that and give these users the information that they need. In addition to that, we've got governments who are looking for generic information about how well businesses are doing, about the general economic environment, and whether they should change their economic policies to potentially improve prospects for business, or maybe they're trying to slow the, the, the business world down, where they're trying to take the heat out of the economy. In that type of situation, they may raise interest rates, they may lower interest rates. It all depends. The general public are interested in that type of economic cycle, but they're also interested in environmental issues. So the general public are very interested in how many rivers you've polluted, how much radiation is produced by your nuclear power plant, those types of things. So we need to get that type of information into our financial statements as well. And this is why financial statements have got a number crunching element and they've got a narrative element where we have words. And the words will explain things in a nice simple fashion such that you don't have to be a qualified accountant to understand what's going on with this company. And that can be really important to me as well. So that's the first part of our conceptual framework, looking at users of financial statements. The second part looks at the qualitative characteristics. Now, these are the qualities surrounding financial information. And what we have is two different sets of qualities. So the two different sets of qualitative characteristics. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at fundamental characteristics first, and then we'll have a look at the enhancing ones later. Fundamental are absolutely essential. So fundamental qualitative characteristics are absolutely essential. And the qualitative characteristics that we're looking at from a fundamental perspective include things such as relevance. We need to make sure that the information that we're producing is relevant to the people making the economic decisions. Now, as we went through our users, you'll note that I said they have these types of decisions, therefore they're looking for this type of information. That now means I need that type of information to be included within my financial statements. Otherwise, it won't be relevant to that user group. If you have information and it's not relevant to any user group, don't bother putting it in the financial statements. And if you ever need to decide whether to put something into the financial statements or not, always think about, is it going to be useful? So is this going to be useful to my users? So is this going to be useful to my users? From a faithful representation perspective, we're looking at whether or not this type of information that we produce is going to be absolutely complete. And this ties in quite nicely with your MA1, MA2 studies. And what's going to happen here is you need to have an understanding of the accurate mnemonic. So do you want information to be absolutely, totally complete? So do you want information to be absolutely, totally complete? You need to make sure that it's free from bias. You need to make sure that the person putting this information together is not attempting to put across their message over the top of the real information within the financial statements. That type of neutrality or free from bias is also called objectivity. So you have to be objective. That's critical to us. And when you come to look at the ethical modules, we'll, we'll talk about objectives such as objectivity in much more detail. They have to be free from material error. And material means it's something that will influence a user's decision. So our definition of materiality 
is all based on user's decisions. So our understanding of materiality is all based on user's decisions. So if that thing will actually change a user's decision, then that makes it material. Something that will change my decision will normally be a very big figure, or it's going to be a figure which turn, turns a small profit into a small loss, or vice versa, or it's material because of the nature of the transaction. So if it's a transaction which is unusual, that suddenly becomes material. I want to see some extra information about that. And those types of transactions will include things such as any transactions with the directors. So any transactions with directors will automatically, by their nature, be material. That's really important to me. The next set of qualitative characteristics we have are known as enhancing characteristics. And you can see a multi-choice question coming up on this without any problem whatsoever. Now, from an enhancing qualitative characteristics perspective, we have comparability. And what we would like is for our financial statements this year to be able to be compared with financial statements from the same company or the same business last year. So we can now develop a trend. So we can now see the analysis over a period of time. That could be really important to me. What I'd also like to be able to do is compare my company's financial statements with other companies within the same industrial sector. So I can see how well we've done in comparison with other businesses in the same area. That now means I can have an understanding of how my business has performed over the last number of years and how my overall industrial sector has performed and where I sit within the industrial sector. That could be really important to me. That now allows my users, my investors, to make the right investment decision. I'd also like to make sure the information I produce can be relied upon, which is the verifiability. And what we have here is an auditing process which allows an independent party to review some of this information to make sure that it looks like it's reasonable. Also, timeliness. If you gave me a set of financial statements that were 10 years old, I probably can't make that much use of that. So what I say here is I'd like to see this financial information reasonably soon. However, don't produce it immediately because I know you need to do some extra checks on it. And also, understandability. I need to make sure that my users can understand exactly what's going on. Understandability is included within things such as standard sets of financial statements, so standard layout, a standard template for our key primary financial statements. So my statement of financial position, my profit and loss account, has got a bog standard format that everybody knows and understands. So once you understand that, you should be able to review any set of financial statements on the planet. Also, I need to make sure that my users can understand the currency being used. So if I started using things such as a Klingon groat, no one's going to understand exactly how much that is worth. So I need to use a presentational currency, which the users will understand. We have an entire standard which looks at that. Now, the underlying assumptions that we have, the next portion of our conceptual framework, the underlying assumptions include things such as a going concern concept. And the going concern con concept says that the business will continue more or less in the same way as it is now for what we call the foreseeable future. This phrase, foreseeable future, is essential. So it will continue for the foreseeable future. The foreseeable future is 12 months. So this thing will continue for the next 12 months. So this idea of a 12-month period is really important to the underlying assumption of going concern. Make a love note here, please, guys. This is also important because of the difference in definition between a current asset, which means you're going to utilize those economic benefits within 12 months, and a non-current asset, where you use them over a period in excess of 12 months. So the going concern concept has a big impact on the definition of whether you have current and non-current assets. If the going concern concept does not apply, you cannot have non-current assets. So there's a nice little tie-in there as well. Other principles which the conceptual framework look at, and we're going to look at all of these in a little bit of detail, guys, so you may need an extra piece of paper to make some extra notes here. The accruals or matching concept is one of these really, really important principles. And what this says is income and expenditure should be matched to the period. Notice the way I'm using period and the emphasis. So income and expenditure should be matched to the period in which it's incurred or earned. That then means it will automatically be matched income to expenditure, but you must match it to the periods first. Must match it to the periods first. What we then also have is the consistency concept. And the consistency concept says that if you have two different transactions, which are the same type of transaction, you should record them in a similar way. 
you should be consistent in the way that you do it. Consistency within our own financial statements and then hopefully consistency across our entire industrial sector will allow for comparability. So consistency will allow for comparability. Now, duality, the duality concept is all about the idea of every transaction having a double whammy effect. This is the debit and the credit effect. So duality says that there's always a two double whammy effect on every single transaction. And we'll, go, we'll have a look at debits and credits in much more detail later on within the course. The business entity concept says that the business itself should be accounted for completely separately from the ownership interest. So the business itself should be accounted for completely separately from the ownership interest. Now, if this is a company, that's dead easy. But if this is a sole trader, what that now means is the sole trader and their business are completely separate. So we only record the business's transactions. We also have what we call the time interval convention. And the time interval convention says that financial statements will cover a certain period of time. That means the profit and loss will tell you what's happened over a certain period. So the profit and loss will tell you what's happened over a certain period. The money measurement concept says that you must measure things in a way that people will understand, such as dollars. People understand how much a dollar is. You may find that your do domestic currency is different to that. I'm completely comfortable, comfortable reporting in any currency as long as my users will understand it. We also then have what's known as the substance over form concept. And what this means is if you're trying to artificially show something which hasn't really happened, what we say is the economic substance, so the economic substance is more important than the legal form. So economic substance is more important than legal form. Make a love note here, guys, and cross-reference this to our definition of asset and liability. Because the definition of asset and liability looks at things such as past transactions and events, we've got future economic benefits going in or out of the business, and then we've got the aspect of control of those economic benefits. We're not talking about legal ownership. We're talking about economic substance. Can you control those economic benefits coming in or going out of the business? Then the historic cost. This actually says, as a starting point, we will always look at the actual cost of something in the, in the past, in their history, to, as our starting point, and then we can potentially revalue things in the future. The revaluation issues come about on future papers, so you don't need to worry about that too much here. But historic cost is our starting point for everything. So all transactions are recorded at their original cost. So all transactions are recorded at their original cost. Now, this brings us up to the end of chapter number one. I do appreciate that. It's a little bit wordy. There's no numbers involved. And I'm thinking, this is supposed to be a financial accounting paper. This is a critical chapter. If you understand these concepts, you'll understand everything else I'm going to be talking to you about within the rest of the chapters. So please make sure you're happy with this. Do have a go at the online questions within the online portal. And then make sure you're totally comfortable with all the concepts. And after all of that, I will see you all on chapter number two. Thank you very much for your time and attention.